shameless plug for, for who we are and where we are. Uh, Monkey King Noodle Company, we opened in uh, 2013 in Deep Ellum uh, in Dallas. Um, kind of took over a defunct little taco stand. It was me and a couple of buddies, and we just had a crazy idea that, that we'd give this a shot. Uh, we picked probably the worst, smallest location possible, thinking if it failed in six months, at least we'd have a good story and we wouldn't be too broke. Uh, fortunately, it took off and we were very lucky. Uh, so we're still in Deep Ellum, and then we recently opened up a store uh, at Legacy Food Hall, uh, way up near uh, Plano and Frisco. So if you guys are ever in the area, feel free. There we go. Um, so basically what we do is we're not a typical Chinese restaurant. We, we wanted to focus on street food. Um, I'm, my parents are from Taiwan, my family's from Taiwan, uh, my sister lives in Hong Kong, so I kind of have people all over Asia, and one of my fondest memories was uh, going back there and, uh, and the street food. It's a pedestrian culture there. Um, you know, you can, you can stumble out of a bar or wherever, um, you know, and, and the streets are just lined with shopping carts of, of people literally just cooking one thing. They've been doing it for 30 years. It's the best thing of that you'll ever have, and you'll probably never have it again because they're gone off to the next city the next day. But it's this type of idea that, like, food's not necessarily three meals a day. It's probably five or six. You know, if you're hungry and you're walking, you just pick up some dumplings, maybe pick up a small bowl of noodles. Uh, and, and that's generally just kind of how people go on in these bigger cities. And so, you know, we wanted a cool location like Deep Ellum, which is somewhat pedestrian for, for Dallas. By Dallas standards, it's very pedestrian. Um, and we wanted a place that people could just come up to, get something really quick and easy, uh, and then be on their way. So the original store, actually, the kitchen was the building. There was actually no inside seating. Uh, there technically wasn't a, a public restroom. We just let people use it, but it was literally in the back of our kitchen. Um, and that's how we got started. So um, I had always wanted two things. Like being from Taiwan, uh, the, the unofficial national dish is, is uh, beef noodle soup. So if anyone's ever had it, it's basically a beef shank that gets slow braised down. Uh, all the hard, kind of tough to eat bits get, uh, get basically braised down to this delicious texture. Um, and it's served with noodles and there's a million variations and everyone's grandma probably makes the best version. But you know, we, we were determined to make one good version for Dallas. Uh, and then we also wanted some dumplings because who doesn't love dumplings? Um, so, that's what we did. Um, I kind of grew up eating this stuff, so it's you know it's really do what you love, do what you know, and, and this is what we chose, and so we kind of went with it. Um, in the process of doing that, we we wanted to find someone that could actually pull noodles, kind of the old school style, and uh, and it is exceedingly rare outside of like China and Flushing, New York, for some reason. Um, and so we we had to scour like Chinese language newspapers nationwide. And we finally found one guy, and, uh, and he was great. He came down, and we were working out the details, and he, all of a sudden, scheduling-wise, had to go back to New York. And so literally for three months, um, he just taught me how to pull noodles. This is something that, like, it was noodle boot camp, basically. You know, seven days a week, at least five hours a day. Uh, literally in my parents' kitchen, he would come over, we'd set up a little stand, and he'd kind of teach me from, this is dough, this is how you hold it and mold it, to... The finished product and um, and it's definitely something that like I equate to like sushi chef where you know you can learn the basics and you can kind of get it down to where it's serviceable but these old school masters that are like 80 years old and, and have no arthritis problems and are still hammering these things out uh, it's pretty amazing to watch them work and it's something that just takes time and effort and just this you know these little minute details that you you don't really know until you actually dive right in and, and kind of go for it so I'll run through kind of a quick history of noodles in China, followed by some really rudimentary science. So if there's any history or science buffs here, sorry ahead of time. These are going to be gross generalizations. Uh, and then we'll actually pull some noodles and kind of walk you through the process of what I'm doing when I'm actually pulling and slamming noodles and stuff like that. Um, shameless plug, uh, Cheap Eats on the Cooking Channel came and did a segment in Dallas. Uh, and they hit up a couple of stands in, in Deep Ellum and we were one of them. So apparently that episode's airing tonight. Um, so my business partner would hate me if I didn't say anything. But, so please watch it. I don't know what time it's at, but uh, it's, on, it's on the cooking channel. Um, okay, so noodles in China. Um, the earliest known writing about the word noodle as we know it uh, came in the Han Dynasty, which is about anywhere from about 0 AD to about 200. Um, and it was basically just a, a, a simple, like, dictionary entry this is a noodle it's defined as dough that's been processed in x whatever fashion um the ongoing debate i think that everyone has is 
where did noodles originate from? The Italians, of course, say it came from Italy. Chinese say it came from China. Uh, who knows? But uh, I will say, in in like 2005, I think there was a uh, there was a uh, like an old river village site excavation, uh, and for some reason they they happened to find a sample of an old bowl, and they broke the bowl open, and it and it was 4,000 year old noodles apparently. So that is technically today the earliest known uh, evidence of noodles in a in a civilization. So. Uh, and it was found right around here in the Qinghai province. And that's what it apparently looks like. So those are 4,000 year old noodles. Um, I'm sure in a couple years, some Italian excavation sites are going to find 6,000 year old noodles in the debate. <laughs> so we'll see. But for now, China, China takes the throne. Um, so why noodles in China? So basically, if you look at China, has anyone ever been to Asia or overseas? Okay, excellent. Um, it's obviously, it's a huge country and it's, it's a long country, so it covers a lot of geography. Um, if you notice kind of up north, kind of where the brown area is, that's mostly grain production. Um, you get a lot of good wind from the desert, not a lot of water, so you're going to get uh, grains. I mean, that's the staple diet there. Uh, people equate like Chinese food with rice, obviously, which, you know, they're not wrong, but uh, most of that rice production is going to be south, uh, where there's these massive rivers and mountains and cool little gorges and stuff. And so uh, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot easier to grow those types of, uh, those types of crops. So um, it's believed that the earliest noodles were actually millet, not wheat flour. Um, wheat actually was not indigenous to China at the time. Through the Silk Road, uh, kind of back and forth, uh, wheat began to come in and millet began to go out. And so you'll start to see it kind of mix into basic staples. But for the most part, in any grain society, uh, you know, it's pretty basic. You grind it together, it turns into flour, you put water in it, and then you can cook it, technically eat it at that point. Variations of that start kind of forming uh, as cuisine forms. So it's pretty likely that, uh, that the first noodles were, were nothing more than just like balls of dough that people either ripped by hand and threw in boiling water or kind of spread out and cut so you can start seeing these little noodle formations. Um, you know, even dumplings were defined as like noodles back then where you actually spread the dough out, wrap something in it, and throw it in a boil. The idea is that it pretty much had to be boiled or steamed at that point. Um, the type of noodle that I'm going to be doing today is Lanzo style. Uh, it's the stretching, the real like theatrical kind, and that actually happened in the Gansu province right there. So you can kind of tell anything along this line is uh, is pretty much grain production. That's that's noodle country right there. Um, Lanzo is the capital of that particular province, and uh, it's generally believed that like essentially the water over there is higher in alkali content naturally, and so alkali, chemically speaking, helps with the noodle making process. It softens the dough a little bit breaks down the molecules, and allows you to be able to manipulate it uh, to however you'd like. So it wasn't a far stretch to see how people, you know, picking water out of that well, putting it into flour, making the dough, eventually were able to start pulling it. Um, a lot of old uh, excavation sites also noted that ash was used. Uh, ash produces sodium bicarbonate, which is another alkali base that you can then, you know, further that process along. Uh, so, the cool science of all this, I say it's cool because I just nerd out stuff like this, but um, <clears throat> most Asian noodles use alkali, so we call them alkali noodles. If you go to like any ramen shop in town now, uh, you'll notice how like the noodles are slightly yellow. Uh, that's actually a reaction, it's oxidation of the alkali. Uh, causes the dough to kind of tint a little bit yellow. Uh, doesn't mean the dough is bad, doesn't mean the flour is bad or anything, it just means that's the reaction you get. Um, the reason you do alkali is it gives it kind of a, only way to describe it is like a soapier feel. It's slightly slicker, it's slightly chewier, and it's, it gives off a little bit more of a fragrance. Um, but it is also essential to be able to manipulate gluten. Um, so real quick, gluten is, uh, is the key to how we can do all of this. Uh, I know gluten's got a really bad rap nowadays, um, and I guarantee you most gluten intolerances probably just the work of marketing but that said we still get people with like celiacs and legit diseases that are horrendous and uh, and those people cannot have a single bit of gluten because it will make them sick for a while but 
For the most part, all gluten is is a protein. It's what happens when these two molecules up top combine and then forms this really wicked looking protein molecule. Um, by adding alkali to that, you're essentially loosening up uh, the blue part of it to where you can kind of stretch and manipulate it. Um, really all we're doing when we're making noodles is, uh, is kind of manipulating the dough to where all those gluten particles um, basically start to form a chain, like a chain link chain. Um, so you, you know, you mix it, you twist it, you pull it, and you're trying to manipulate everything to where you can kind of pull that gluten and interconnect it to where you can pull it to, you know, filament thin layers. I mean, it could be the, the thickness of a hair if you wanted it to. Um, and those are, you know, those are largely for show. You obviously can't eat those that much. But um, those are kind of the basics of, of noodle pulling and, and kind of getting, uh, getting the dough to where it is. By the way, if anybody has questions, just chime in. I talk really fast and loud. So, so when you're pulling, is this friction, is this pulling as part of the chain making, is that also the heat? No, it's not really. Uh, in fact, like, it's, it's kind of weird because people ask, like, hey, what's the recipe? And I'm like, I'll happily give it to anyone because there's, like, a set recipe use, and then there's, like, the environmental conditions around it. So, like, I was just telling Mark, I was like, hey, it's a little hot and a little humid here. Like, it's going to affect the dough in a little bit, so you got to play around with it. So, like, uh, most of the kitchens I've been in have been, like, really hot and humid because they're tiny and, and not very well equipped and so I'm kind of used to it but like you know in these grand kitchens that have this amazing AC units um, it, it'll freeze the dough up a little bit so you kind of have to manipulate it that way but essentially it's the stretching and the twisting that's that's kind of loosening everything and then like rearranging loosening rearranging and you just kind of manipulate it until you get it to a point where uh, where you know it's it's whatever whatever thickness you want um, and then there's, I mean, there's a million variations of this. Um, there's no, I mean, correct way to, to get the noodles you want. Um, certain noodles you'll notice are the broad ones, like the Xi'an style, where they basically just pull it once and then kind of tear it down the middle. Uh, those are like the broader flat noodles. Um, you know, I, I think all of those just kind of, kind of grew out of a necessity of the cuisine. So, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have like a lot of good bone stock and broth, then you're gonna want thinner noodles. But if you need something a little hardier, then you go with the thicker. And then um, if you just can't like flatten or pull noodles, then there's a knife cut method, which if you look at videos on YouTube, it's actually really cool and I wanted to try it, except I'm afraid we're you know gonna injure the staff. But they basically just take dough and take a knife and just kind of shave it off. And it's, you know, these perfect little strands that go off every time. Um, and we've tried it before just to, hilarious failure but uh, so we'll stick with this method but um, all right, let's just get this. um so we use a combination of lye water and uh, there's basically this alkali powder from China um, we've never been able to kind of figure out what the actual balance is because it kind of varies from package to package but uh, in general we're using about a 10% by water solution so I mean, it's pretty mild. It's enough to, to manipulate it, um, but once in the cooking process, it kind of takes out any of the funk or any of the, any of the, uh, are there, uh, are there different names for the different noodles, like the broad ones or what names? Yeah, it's, it's mostly equated with regions. So like Xi'an styles, flatter typically. So if you went somewhere and you're like, oh, Xi'an style noodles, generally it'll be like a broader flat noodle. If it's like Lanzo style, it's like the more traditional noodle that you're used yeah. to seeing. So I actually made this dough like 20 minutes ago, I think. So. so you can kind of see it's already got a bit of a stretch to it. Um, and you'll notice the color. I mean, I used all-purpose flour, high gluten flour, and, uh, and a little bit of Korean flour. For some reason, um, and I can't explain why, and I still haven't been able to find out because I don't speak Korean, but like Korean flour is amazing. And it's like the easiest thing to cook with. It, it tastes delicious. Um, the only thing I figured out is like they use American wheat. They just take it over and like do some sort of magic to it, and it comes back like twice as expensive. But like we still have to use it. Um, and we've tried like doing alternatives with like no Korean flour, and it just doesn't look the same for us. So it might be psychological on our part, but at this point we just keep going with it. Well, where do you get Korean flour? H uh, Mart. <clears throat> yep, there's a good old H Mart not too far from our place. So. Um, <laughs> 
we've been lucky enough that like we have a commissary. So our dumpling production has vastly become like our largest labor pool, uh, our largest like labor intensive thing. Um, and so we actually had to, it's funny, like, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Dallas, but Deep Ellum's like not the greatest of neighborhoods. Uh, we kind of picked it because me and my partners just like drinking there and we're like, hey, this would be a great place to have food when you're drunk. But like we needed like Chinese ladies that knew how to wrap dumplings and like none of them were going to drive on the highway to like go to Deep Ellum of all places. And so we finally had to make a commissary kitchen up in Plano. Uh, so that's like kind of fastly becoming a bigger portion of our business, which was unexpected. It's great because we do love dumplings and if you guys ever want a dumpling class, we've, we've got plenty of, plenty of knowledge about that. But well, I have a, I have friends who, we have the Kettle uh, Art Gallery, so I'm an artist. Oh yeah. And so I'm at the Kettle all the time, that's where I saw you. Oh, excellent. So love you the Kettle. Yeah. Um, so I'm just kind of getting the dough balanced right now. Um, so slamming it basically kind of loosens everything up. It's, it's getting it to where it's a lot easier to manipulate. So notice it's starting to get a little stretchier. This is just oil. That's a little bit of the alkali water solution, just to kind of keep things a little loose for me. And Mr. Early, did you say how you make alkali? What you put in it to make alkali? Oh, it's a it's a powder that you can get. Most like Chinese supply stores have it. Okay. Uh, a so lot of people. Like baking soda or anything like that. No, no, no. I've I've heard if you because baking soda is not terribly strong when it comes to like its alkali properties, but I heard if you like. Get it slightly damp and then dry it out in like a toaster oven. It it like amplifies the effects. I've never been able to try it, but that's just something I've heard. Or you can use like basically lye water or sodium bicarbonate, which you can get at any Asian grocery store. So when I'm twisting, it's basically setting all the noodle strands together. Uh, you'll notice they're gonna start forming the more times you twist it. Uh, no, it's just because it's sticky dough right now, so it just keeps it off my hands. So the oil doesn't affect it? No. I mean, just don't put that much in there. Yeah. yeah just enough so... so you just put it on your hands. Yeah, so it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't get too sticky. It's also slightly humid in here, so yeah. uh, the dough is a little bit... Yeah, so the guy that taught me had to go back to New York, and he came back a couple of times, but uh, he's he's just kind of one of those weird free spirits that's like, oh, I'll be here for a little bit, and then, and then two days later he's gone. So I believe there's one more guy in Dallas. He used to work for Royal China, um, and I don't think he works there anymore, but I think he's floating around somewhere. Um, so we also have to do... Uh, basically the sheet or cutter program. So, I mean, we still make all the dough ourselves. We still handle the process. Um, but we have the big commissary kitchen that kind of mass produces for us. Just because once we got to multiple stores, it was impossible for me. Plus these are like super hydrated and very fresh. So you can't, like we couldn't store these and then cook them the next day because they'd be not great. flour to keep it stable. So at this point, all the gluten's pretty much lined up. It could just be stretched out as much as you want. Um, 
So kind of the trick behind it is it's one long line right now, but you're essentially making a circle. So you have two sides, loop it around. You now have four, loop it around one more time. So it exponentially increases every time until, oh, I'm just tightening the end up so it doesn't get completely loose. So basically there you go. I'll make a couple of more. Oh, so another question I always get is uh, eggs versus no eggs. Um, in Taiwan, there are a lot of restaurants that use eggs in their dough. It's not a necessity just because with like a mix of high gluten and all purpose flour, like you get enough bite that like it'll hold. Um, it, honestly, it makes no difference. We've tried, we've tried it both ways and we just can't figure out like, I mean, I guess taste wise, but even then I think once it's covered with like sauce and everything, you really can't, you know, you really can't discern one way or the other. Do what? Yes, definitely. Um, especially like once the chemistry, the alkali starts going in, it's on a timer basically. The, the more it air dries, the more it kind of dissipates. So occasionally I'll like add more water in there just to kind of keep it going. Um, plus it dries out pretty quickly with all the, all the touching and movement. I can actually make them here. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. This is kind of hilariously like the Lonzo cheating way of nuking broad noodles. Um, is basically instead of keeping it round, you just flatten out the noodle. So basically just flatten. And then just depending on how thick you want it, So then basically flat noodles at that point. <laughs>